everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Patrick and I run Miller's Wildlife and Conservation Specialist. Basically, this is just a company I started back in 2019 to be able to bring humans and nature closer together. As in my opinion, as humans, we are constantly growing, we're constantly expanding, and inevitably we are going to be interacting with nature more than we have ever imagined. And almost every single audience I ask, what is a good snake out there? They oftentimes end out with saying a dead snake. And what we don't know enough about, we naturally fear that animal. And whenever we fear that animal, we want it gone. However, humans and nature can coexist together, and that's my intention, is being able to reconnect us and learn from one another. Learn what makes each animal so special, so unique, and then maybe even ways that they can help us out together. So today I'm here at All Furnace Fest down at the Pine Grove Furnace State Park along the Appalachian Trail, and I brought with me a number of different birds of prey that you can find not only here in Pennsylvania, but quite frankly, all over the United States. I give audiences opportunities to be able to see these birds up close and personal, nose to beak, learn about what makes each one so special, what makes them unique, and then maybe even ways that we can benefit one another throughout our lifetime. What made you get involved in this? So what made me get involved with doing wildlife education? Well, basically I grew up in nature. I grew up surrounded by animals. I grew up you know, hunting, hiking, camping, you name it. I was outside all the time. And I never really had that same understanding that not everyone grew up like that and not everyone was comfortable with that until I started working at Zoo America in the education department in 2006 and during that time I traveled all over the state and I worked with about 70 different animals from invertebrates to reptiles to mammals to birds you named it I, I worked with it um, and when I would bring out an animal to an audience especially in inner city school if you show a skunk to a bunch of inner city school kids, they lose their minds and they've never seen something like that before. But yet almost everybody who lives out in the country has seen skunks. So this is my opportunity to bring these animals out. Um, and so really it was my initial involvement at Zoo America that got me to realize that not everyone knows enough about an animal. And so then at that point, I decided to make my whole life about clearing up misconceptions, reconnecting people with nature, and really just getting a better relationship formed with one another. We can learn, we can benefit from each other so much more than we've ever even realized. We just have to understand the concept that humans are not perfect and we and animals can do things that we cannot do. Mm -hmm. So even look at the peregrine falcon. If it weren't for that bird right there, we would not have modern jet technology. The Peregrine is built for extreme high speeds. They can dive at over 200 miles per hour. A jet engine after a certain speed would stall out because it could never get enough airflow going through it. But if you look at the nostril of a Peregrine Falcon, they have a small cone inside that breaks up the wind current and allows them to breathe, breathe naturally. And now if we look at any modern jet engine to this day, right in the center, you see that little cone. And now we have jets that can go Mach 3, Mach 4, even at extreme high altitudes when the air is very, very thin. So we can learn so much more about this. And this is what really has fed into my passion for bringing the animals out and getting them around people because you know, you'll never have that same sense of appreciation if you're just looking at a picture or if you're just looking at a video or a pelt. It's not until you actually see that animal in person, up close, that you finally understand that's why they're so special. Okay. And is there a reason that you focus in on the birds? The birds of prey have always been my passion. Now, of course, at working with any kind of wildlife does require numerous permits. And there's no one organization that encompasses all of the wildlife of Pennsylvania. You know, you have your birds and your mammals, which are regulated by the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Then you have your invertebrates and your reptiles and the fish that are uh, regulated by the PA Fish and Boat Commission. And each, uh, each one requires their own separate sets of permits just to be able to utilize wild animals for educational presentations. Now, at the time, I fulfill all of the various requirements, but I just don't necessarily have them. And in some instances, my passion is really in the birds of prey, even though I love talking about many different types of wildlife, I, per I prefer birds of prey above all others. But with that being said, I do eventually want to get to a point where I can incorporate some of these other animals into it. Um, and however, whenever I'm doing educational shows, all of my birds are rehabilitated. They have some sort of wing or eye injury that would prevent them from being able to be released back out in the wild. Now, in most scenarios, that would be the end of that bird's life. If they get injured and no one finds them, no rehabilitator can help them out, they are done and they are out of this. 
But in, this, in these instances, these birds were found, they were rehabilitated. Unfortunately, the damage was done. They cannot go back out in, uh, into the wild anymore. But this way, I can give them a whole new lease on life. I can give them an opportunity to be an ambassador for their species, be an opportunity to be able to teach about what that individual animal makes or what makes them so special and unique. Um, and then also in this case, I can give them again, a longer lifespan. I can get, uh, they can live to be about 20 to 30 years in captivity when ultimately they would have been gone. So this way they can continue to go on. They can have a productive living lifestyle. And then this way also bring people closer to nature as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you for your time, Patrick. And we look forward to your presentation here coming up. It is my pleasure and thanks again. How's everyone doing this morning? Good, excellent. What a lovely, lovely day outside today. Much less rainy than it was yesterday, although it was a little bit more breezy, but hey, that's fall. And even then, whenever that breeze has that bite to the air, it's just, a, I love it. Now, my name is Patrick though, and I am here from a business called Miller's Wildlife. And basically I travel all over the state and I give audiences opportunities to be able to get to see an animal up close and personal. But most importantly, I like to use a lot of animals that are native right in our area. And oftentimes my ultimate goal is to reconnect us with nature. Oftentimes people will tend to be afraid of something. Especially if you don't know enough about an animal, what do we tend to do? We fill in the blanks and we pull from movies, we pull from TV shows, areas where love to over dramatize an animal and most importantly give that animal the opportunity to do anything it ever wanted to. Well, in reality, all animals have limitations. And most importantly of all, animals have ways of benefiting us and we have ways to benefit them as well. And so working together, if you think about it, we are all on this planet together we are inevitably going to run into one another so we have to learn how to coexist and ultimately at the end of my day at the end of my show i don't need you to love an animal the same way because of course i know i'm weird but if you don't hate this animal and if you can learn that maybe just maybe there is some important significance behind having someone like this in your area well then i think i did my job right now all of my different animals that i use are in fact wild these are 100% wild critters. And do, uh, being those, they do not like to be pet, kissed, cuddled, hugged, or anything like that. However, during my presentation, I will walk all around. I'll give you guys a very nice opportunity to be able to see these birds up close and personal. You'll get a very nice nose to beak look at each and every single one of them. I just ask that while I am walking around talking about that bird, you do not try to reach out, pet, kiss, cuddle, hug, or anything like that. And definitely don't even try it with the birds either. Um, but also, if you guys have some questions, how do you ever let me know you have questions? By raising your hand. Now, I will do my absolute best to answer your question, but please believe me when I tell you I am not an actual expert. I play one very, very well, but I'm not an expert. Now, I will actually make up a funny story and figure out your question anyway, but ultimately I will do my best to try to answer your question. It's just at the end of every bird, that's whenever I'll take a break and I'll see if you guys have those questions. So while I'm actually talking about the bird, just keep your arm down. And then, like I said, at the end, that's whenever I'll open up the floor. But with all that stuff being said, let's start talking about birds of prey. Now, if you ask me, I love birds, like, you know, birds are cool. But for me, I love birds of prey. These guys are very, very, very special in many different ways, shapes, and forms. And be a bird of prey in general, they actually got their name for one kind of major particular reason above all others. What is that one thing that makes a bird of prey a bird of prey? Do they say their prayers before bedtime? They eat. They eat. Prey. Prey. They are predators. These are birds that are specially meant to chase, catch, kill, and eat another animal for food. So if you set up a bird feeder at your backyard, are they eating the seeds at your bird feeders? No. no. But are they eating the things that are eating the seeds at your bird feeders? Yes. yes. And that is an aspect of life that we must always remember. Do not believe what Disney has made it nature out to be. It is not sunshine, butterflies, and rainbows out there. Everybody is not best friends with everybody else. Most importantly of all, in nature, we need balance. And whenever a population becomes out of control, predators come through to balance that population out. And so 
oftentimes I get audience members who tell me, Patrick, I feel like I've been seeing lots and lots of hawks this year. Well, you very well could be. This could be a spike year for hawks. Now last year, if the rodent population surged and we were up to our eyeballs in rodents, the following year we will be up to our eyeballs in hawks. And nature will go in cycles and it will always work at balancing itself. But nonetheless, no two birds of prey are exactly the same. In fact, there are actually four major groups of birds of prey out there. Do you happen to know the four major groups? I bet you probably do. Raptors. Well, that's a big umbrella of them all. But then they're di divided up. Hawks, owls. the night shift, the owls, falcons. falcons, and eagles. Very good. Now you also have some other ones as well. Have you ever heard of ospreys? Yeah, yeah. 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 well, dude, I love ospreys. They're so cool. Have you ever heard of a kite? Yes. yes. Not the one that, not the one at the park. <laughs> the Mississippi <laughs> kite snail kite those are all also birds of prey but those are like the weird cousins they're technically related they're, you know you see them at the family union but we don't talk to them they're weird all right so this is hawkeye and anyone have an idea what hawkeye actually is a red-tailed red hawk how'd you know oh yeah that's right they have a giant name tag on the back of them and the red-tailed hawk is one of the most common birds of prey to find not only here in Pennsylvania, but quite frankly, all over the United States. These guys are one of the most abundant birds of prey out there because they have one of the most adaptable, versatile natures to them. They can survive in almost any habitat imaginable and hunt for many, many different types of prey items. However, it does create a little bit of an issue because it makes people think that all I have to do to come up with the name of a bird of prey is pick a body part, describe that body part, and put the word hawk at the end of it. I mean, we do have the red-shouldered hawk, rough-legged hawk, broad-winged hawk, bald eagle, go it doesn't always work out that way. But the red tail did in fact get that name because of that very, very notable feature on their body. And if you see that thing from a mile away, you know exactly what you're looking at. However, they actually tend to be one of the most misidentified birds on this planet because not every red-tailed hawk actually have a red tail on them. And why on earth would a red tail not have a red tail? Maybe it's a weird mutant red tail? That's a good guess, but no, it's not mutation. Juvenile. It's a juvenile. Essentially a bird under one year old. And every bird of prey out there will have some sort of slight color difference between the juvenile versions and the adult versions of themselves. So that first year of life, they have a grayish brown tail with dark bands going down the length of it. And then after that first birthday, that's whenever they molt out all their juvenile feathers, grow in their adult feathers, and officially earn their names. Now the red tail though, to actually find this bird, it is so insanely easy. Go to a highway, go to 81. <laughs> Any highway that has a grassy section is loaded with red tails because those grassy areas are mouse supermarkets. There's billions of rodents in there, and you're looking at about one of the only things that can really get into those middle ones and catch those rodents in there. But if you can imagine you're sitting on top of a telephone pole trying to find a mouse in the grass on the other side of the road, is that very easy? Sure it is if you have eyes like a hawk. <laughs> but what does that even mean? We know they see well, but how well? Well, average is about six to seven times better than what you can see right now. And just to give you a perspective, if you were like a hawk, you could read a book across the football field. Not to mention spotting movement that fast, locking in on it and then swooping after it using those great big broad wings. That's first thing in the morning that they want to get themselves a nice big breakfast. And then the rest of their day is just been kind of doing fun things. However, in the afternoon, especially on a day like today, the best place to find red tails, up in the sky. And often you'll see them circling. And you can see other birds circling. You can see vultures circling. You might even see eagles if you're really lucky. And what does that mean when we see them circling like that? Okay. Maybe, maybe there's food underneath them. What if they're circling you? They're waiting. Maybe you're next. Yeah, look a little livelier. <laughs> but in reality, it's got nothing to do with food at all. Remember, they ate first thing in the morning. And the bigger that meal is, the less they're ever going to have to hunt again. So if he caught a rabbit, she's done hunting today, done hunting tomorrow, and maybe even the day after that. 
However, you're still looking at an animal with a certain set of something. What does she have that I don't? Wings. wings. And let me tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, if I had a set of wings, the absolute last place you would ever find me is on the ground. Up there, you need to think, it's a whole new world. It's a new fantastic point of view. And I'm not singing it either. But they love to fly. They love to glide and they love to soar. But if they're flapping, they're burning off all those calories that they work so hard to get. So if they can find a way to fly that doesn't require flapping, that's even better. And at that point, when they circle, they have found something called a thermal or a pocket of hot air. And they circle to stay inside of that pocket and ride it like an elevator to take them thousands of feet up into the sky where they can stay airborne for hours on end. And even right now, in the peak of their fall migration, they can cover hundreds of miles in a day, all without having to flap one time. Now, Hawkeye, though, she actually came to me from Minnesota, or not Minnesota, uh, from West Virginia after getting hit by a car. Happens a lot, especially if you hunt along the side of a highway and you now have to cross that highway to catch something on the other side. There is a very important rule about crossing that road, and that is look both ways and well, or go really high. Um, but even though they can see so much better than us, when they get locked in on something, it's easy to develop tunnel vision and they neglect the world that's around them. And unfortunately, in her case, she got hit by a car. It broke her right wing, which did actually heal. But the one body part that didn't her right eye and she can no longer see out of that eye anymore and then uh, that was what deemed her non-releasable and once you are non-releasable there is no opportunity to go back out in the wild because if you do not have perfect eyesight perfect flight you will never be able to effectively hunt by yourself anymore now don't feel bad for her because this bird gets free room and board free food, free Medicare, and all she has to do is sit here and look pretty for 15 minutes at a time. And then also on top of it, I can double their life expectancies. So this bird went from pretty much being a goner in nature to now being able to live 20 to 30 years in captivity with me, where she can be an ambassador for her species and have a much more productive lifestyle. Now this next talk though, is a little less common. You ever walk your dog? He forgets he's on his leash, runs, hits the end of it, it's like, Ugh! these guys do the same thing. Um, it's just more chaotic when there's wings involved. Now, does anyone know what kind of hawk this one is? Harris hawk or Harris's hawk, or sometimes even called the bay wing hawk because the uh, arm. Yeah, remember that red tail? But either way, the Harris hawk though, don't feel bad if you've never seen this bird before, if you don't know what they are, because this is a little bit of a trick that I play on most of my audiences. The Harris hawk does not live in Harrisburg. Instead, they are only found in one part of the country, and that is the desert of the Southwest. Places like Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, down into parts of Mexico, and basically they love to live in the deserts. Now, they are incredibly unique for a couple of different reasons. Not only do they only live in one part of the country, but then also the way these birds like to hunt is incredibly unique. There is only one time of year that a bird of prey will actually kind of hang out with one another. And it is, of course, the most important time of year. It is mating season. Mating season. And if you guys don't know what mating season is, that's okay. Just ask mom and dad about it on the drive home. They'll tell you later. Don't, don't Google it. <laughs> Don't Google it. But for the most part, birds of prey are incredibly solitary creatures. They do not like to hang out with one another. In fact, even a mated pair of birds of prey are a lot like a couple who's only staying together until their kids are in college and out of the house. One hunts one way, the other hunts the other way, and they don't typically cooperate with one another. However, if you go down to the southwest where the Harris hawks live, you might find four, five, six, seven, maybe even eight or more living together, hunting together, working together in a great big family unit, much like another group of predators who will hunt as a team of North America, which are wolves. And Harris Hawks have the nickname of wolves 
with wings because they will actively work as a group to tackle much larger prey than they would ever be able to handle by themselves. Which down in the southwest, one of their normal prey items by themselves are going to be things like snakes, lizards, small birds, maybe a small mammal like a my mice or other small rodents like that, and maybe even a desert cottontail. However, what's another type of bunny of the southwest? A jackrabbit. Have you ever seen one of those things? They're monsters. Imagine that cute little cottontail in your backyard, except this thing is the size of a small dog. Six to eight pounds with a giant set of legs that are built for kicking and bucking and running. And now a pound and a half bird, or in her case, a two pound bird, trying to tackle an eight pound jackrabbit is almost exactly like watching the rodeo. That bird is gonna get bucked off and nobody gets anything to eat at all. However, if I bring in the whole family, mom, dad, brother, sister, four hair socks is now 32 talons that are working together to tackle and subdue that prey. And even the way they hunt is so incredibly unique because we know hawks like to hunt from a nice tall perch but down in the desert, what's one of the tallest perches out there? Yeah, and if they have their arms, they're over 150 yeah. years old. Those are few and far between. So when they find that nice tall saguaro, they perch one on top of it. And then they bring another bird over and perch up on top of that one. And they will actually stack themselves two, three, maybe even four Harris hawks high, like a great big totem pole, just to get a better look at everything that's happening around them. And then they send the younger generation, the first year birds, onto the ground to run around like dogs and try to scare out that prey. And then the whole family dog piles in on top of it. And with each additional Harris that gets added into the equation, the odds of success start to go up. Because if the first bird misses it, chances are the second one won't. But even if the second one did miss it, it's now caused that rabbit to hesitate just long enough and if the third bird can even get a foot onto it and slow it down, now the first two can catch back up again and everyone wins. But then even the younger generation have the opportunity to learn the right techniques to subdue larger prey by themselves. But if we think about hawks and some of their capabilities, you know, a, a two pound bird trying to tackle an eight pound jackrabbit, well, that does sound like that small dog, right? And I've gotten the question a lot of, Patrick, I've been walking my, my dog. This red tail came over. Is it gonna swoop down, pick up my cute little Pomeranian and fly away with it and eat it? No, I wanna rip my hair out every time I get that question. A bird of prey cannot pick up and fly off with the small animal. In fact, remember, they all have limitations and they can only fly with half of their body weight in size. So if it's a two pound bird, well, if I did my math correctly, that's only a one pound item. So no, that hawk will not pick up your, your small dog and fly off with it and eat it. They will simply tackle it on the ground and eat it in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not saying though, like it, it's not normal. I'm not saying a hawk has never attacked a dog. It's happened. But you need to understand what just happened. A starving bird of prey who has nothing left to live for. And unless they get some meat in their belly in the near future, they are done. They will go after some weird things. They will do some not normal stuff, but you cannot judge them for it. Guys, we have been there ourselves. Taco Bell at 2 a.m. It's not good for you, but at the time it's doing the job. So as long as you are there with your dog, oftentimes you have nothing to worry about. Birds of prey are opportunistic predators. And if you remove the opportunity, you already won. Now, any questions about Harris Hawks? Age limit. About 20 to 30 again in captivity, and about 10 to 15 out the wild. Thank you. Yes. Is it hard for them to adapt up here because of it being colder? So if this is a Southwestern bird, is the cold a problem for them? And yes, because they are a Southwest, they're not all that well insulated. They're incredibly heat tolerant, but it's like going out in winter in shorts and a t-shirt. So if it gets too cold,
they can still suffer from the same hypothermia, frostbite, the same cold related issues that we can, but if you acclimate them to it, you can sometimes get them through it. Now, all of my, uh, all my Harris's, if it gets below 32 degrees overnight, they will get a heat lamp on them just to take the edge off. But during the day, I do nothing for them because I want them to acclimate to that. Now, those were hawks, but the thing is, like I said earlier, no two birds of prey are exactly the same. Hawks are not like falcons, are not like eagles, they're not like owls. They're all unique in their own little way, shape, or form. And what it boils down to is what they like to hunt and uh, where they like to hunt at. Now, this is one of the most famous birds of prey out there. Do you know what this one is? A peregrine falcon. And the reason why it's the most famous one out there is because you are looking at the fastest animal on the planet. And now, normally speaking, when it... He is so fast, he just left and came back. <laughs> Did you even see it? No. And that's just, that's not how it works at all. Now, normally speaking, whenever we do think of the fastest animal, what's one everyone thinks about? That cheetah, who is running across the ground at 60 miles per hour. That is insanely challenging for anything to do. You're not getting me running that fast unless I'm chasing Mr. Frosty. But instead, the peregrine, where they get their speed is not on a horizontal flight, but out of a vertical dive. A pigeon can outfly this bird any day of the week on a horizontal flight. But if you put them up at 2,000 feet and let them go into a vertical dive, now this bird can very easily reach speeds at well over 200 miles per hour. With so far, even the fastest one recorded at 242 miles per hour in a vertical dive. Now they think a female can even hit 300 miles per hour. But to try to get a female peregrine to go pedal to the metal full throttle after something is like trying to get kids to do their homework. Just doesn't work. But what are they hunting for? What is that two pound feathered missile hunting for at 200 miles per hour? Mice, that's a good guess because of course many other birds eat mice. But put yourself into his feathers. You are diving out of the sky at 200 miles per hour and you hit a mouse on the ground. <laughs> it's gotta be another bird. Fish, well fish are in the water and water is a very soft object until my dad launched us off the inner tube. Then it wasn't soft anymore. But another bird flying in the air or on the wing as we call it. And the peregrine actually has a nickname of the duck hawk because it said that the duck was the biggest bird that they can catch all by themselves. Now looking at Sonny, can he catch a duck? No, no he's a little guy, he's a little piddly <laughs> peregrine. And in reality, no, a male peregrine could never handle a duck unless it was maybe a wood duck, like a small species. However, in the bird of prey world, the girls are bigger than the boys are in all birds of prey. The males are roughly one third smaller than that female is. Hence the name Tearsel, which means one third. So the p male peregrine, he's going after things like jays, flickers, starlings, and things like that. Whereas a female can definitely tackle a duck. And what they do is they use these very long scraggly little witch looking like toes to slash on their way down. And they aim for the head, the neck, or the wing of that other bird. And even if it doesn't outright kill the other bird, most likely it's going to break it, going to knock it towards the earth, giving him more than enough time to slam on the brakes and pull out of his dive, where he can withstand more pressure on his body than any other animal out there. Upwards of 28 Gs. Which, just to give you an idea, an astronaut going into space, or even most roller coasters, will make you feel 4 Gs. A person will pass out at seven and die at nine. If you stopped and pulled 28, your brain would squish to the front of your head and come out your nose. And yes, they do have brains. They don't work, but they have them. But the thing is, if the red tail try that, it's gonna blow every feather right off of their body. But yet the feathers of a peregrine are much more stiff and rigid to provide plenty of support to be able to pull out of that dive and survive. 
Now finding peregrines though, this one's a little bit different because I've gotten, I've gotten the, you know, the story every so often about, you know, someone who has a bird feeder set up in their backyard in a somewhat suburban environment and they swear they've been seeing peregrines come in and take their birds off the bird feeder. I, I had this conversation yesterday. I felt so bad because it's not a peregrine. You will almost never find a peregrine in your backyard unless you live in a downtown metropolitan. Peregrine falcons absolutely love to live in a major city because originally they would nest on a cliffside near a body of water, but they were wiped out thanks to a pesticide called DDT. And whenever they started to breed them and reintroduce them, they found that the peregrine falcons really, really love to live in the city. Because if you would normally nest on a cliffside near a body of water, what's a great substitute in the city then? A skyscraper. Plus, every city has some kind of body of water close by. Not to mention, if you were a bird who eats other birds for dinner, what are you eating? It's like living at McDonald's. They have more food than they could have ever imagined. These are one of the most widely distributed birds of prey on this globe. Um, now, the thing is though, that pesticide, I wanna have a little conversation with you guys about conservation. Now, of course, nuisance wildlife is what it is. No one likes whenever you get mosquitoes in your backyard. No one likes getting mice in your house. No one likes having weeds in your garden. So what do we do? We take the easy route. We use pesticides. We use herbicides. We use rodenticides. And any time we introduce a chemical toxin into the equation, any time we introduce it into the ecosystem, we are inevitably affecting more than just that target species. Because if that little mouse comes along and eats that pesticide or that rodenticide, does he just go, ah, ah. no, he wanders away and then it dies. But what happens if it gets caught by a great horned owl? It's gonna die. What happens if it gets caught by a red tail, a kestrel? a barn owl, a harrier. I can go on all day. What about your dog at home? Your cat that you let out of the house, it's not supposed to. Anytime we introduce toxins, we are affecting more than just one thing out there. So while yes, it might be easy, that doesn't mean it's the best thing to do. However, if you can introduce or if you can encourage birds of prey, natural forms, wildlife to come into your area and you allow them to live there they will balance that out themselves if you get bats in your area one big brown bat will eat four thousand mosquitoes a night and do they come one at a time though hundreds you now have the most effective form of mosquito control out there so now those first three birds, when do they normally come out and are active? Daytime. Now, of course, is that the only time that birds prey are ever active? Nope. No, because of course, since we have uh, daytime animals, we need daytime predators, but we have nighttime animals, so we need a nighttime predator too. But if you come out at nighttime, there is that special word that describes you. You are called being? Nocturnal. Nocturnal. Now, if you come out at nighttime and you are nocturnal, does that mean there's a special word for an animal who comes out during the daytime? Who's it? That's you? Good job. Diurnal. Wait, were you here yesterday? All right, cool. Yeah, you're che no cheating. Uh, but diurnal. Now, isn't that normal? Aren't you a normal animal? If you're diurnal, you come out during the day, aren't you normal? Not necessarily. Exactly. <laughs> normal is not normal normal for crying out loud guys i have birds of prey that live at my house is that normal <laughs> sure it is for my friends and i and so just remember normal is never normal in nature we all have a job we all have a role a niche to fill but my net my last bird for you guys is in fact a nocturnal bird of prey Now, which one is this? Great the great horn owl, very good. I'm glad you guys actually used that proper term in there. The great horn owl. 
Because let me tell you, sometimes people just laze it up and they call him a horned owl. Which, you know, don't get me wrong, he does have horns, but he's not an okay horned owl. He's not an all right. I mean, he is all right, but um, but he's not even the only horned owl out there. But if you look at him, he's great. He's big. He's huge. He is massive. For crying out loud, his nickname is the Tiger of the Woods. But when you're looking at the Great Horn, he did in fact get that name because of these two things that stick out the top of his head. Are they actually horns, though? No. no. Are they his ears? Yes. Oh, so if I pull them off, he can't hear anymore. No. no. His ears are on either side of his face. A bird can control almost every feather at various spots of their body. They just move their skin. So if he wanted to, he can make himself super duper big and puffy and fluffy, or even very small and skinny. The feathers on his chest and on his back look nearly identical to the bark of the tree. He throws these ear tufts up and it breaks up his outline. Now he doesn't even look like an owl anymore. But then it can also fold flat. Come standard, all models, no additional charge. But that breaks up his outline. He'll close his eyes, he has feathers on his eyelids. And I guarantee you have walked right past an owl and you've never even known it. That's how good these guys are at hiding during the day from us. But at nighttime, now he's hiding from his prey. But how do you think he finds his prey at nighttime? Well, some listen, barn owls, barred owls, ones that have that very prominent facial disc are great listeners. Not him. Those eyes, those massive, massive yellow eyes. Those eyes though, very, very powerful. But what do you think would happen if I were to take him over into one of the offices? I closed all the doors, closed all the windows, pulled all the blinds, shut out all the lights, and I made that office totally dark. No light whatsoever. Will he still be able to see? No. In total darkness, an owl's eyes do not work. However, they are as large as what they are to allow in as much light as possible and then amplify that light as much as possible. But regardless, they need just the tiniest amount to be able to see. Whether it be the back porch lights of a house, the headlights of a car, or even just the light of a full moon on a clear night just to find that prey. Does he have to fly fast at night? No. Exactly. <laughs> Not if you can fly quietly. And so when he flaps, they don't make a single sound at all. So not only could you have walked right past an owl, you could have had this thing fly right over your head and you never even knew it. This is like a ninja sneaking through the forest ambushing prey when it least expects it. Which even thinking about that prey, remember, if you are the tiger of the woods, what do you want? What do you think you might want to hunt for? I was hoping so. No, that they don't hunt tigers. Now, granted, though, they hunt mammals, but mammals of varying sizes. Oh, you know, maybe small rodents like mice, chipmunks, rats, squirrels, maybe of a bigger mammal like a rabbit, for example. You're also looking at the only animal who is truly capable and good at catching skunks. And why is he the only one? so good at catching skunks. He's got no sense of smell at all. No bird other than the turkey vulture actually has a good sense of smell. And if your defense mechanism is the fact that you are the stinkiest animal on the planet, the second the predator can't smell you, that goes right out the window. But let me ask you this, can a golden eagle kill a skunk? <laughs> Are you just being difficult today? No. Well, no bird has a sense of smell other than the turkey vulture. So can a golden eagle kill a skunk? Absolutely. I mean, for crying out loud, they can kill wolves. But why don't they? They don't come out at night time. So the great horned owl comes out the same time as a skunk. He is big enough. He can ambush that skunk. He has no sense of smell. But here's the last kicker of all. He's strong enough. This two pound bird, his foot 
fully stretched out. That fuzzy little tootsie is the size of the palm of my hand. And out of one foot alone, he can produce over 500 pounds of force, or the equivalent of three of me stacked up on ourselves, standing on just one big toe, pushing four claws right in. Once they have that prey, it is over. Now Lester though, he actually came to me for my old mentor. Well, he got him from a wildlife rehabilitator after Lester fell out of his nest, landed in a creek, and almost died. And in that time, a family had come along, found him, and took him home, kept him for about a week before getting him to the wildlife rehabilitator. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal, right? Kind of seems kind of cool, right? Oh, I love it. Awesome. Because now, unfortunately, social media has ruined a lot of nature for people. It glamorizes having birds of prey as pets. Believe me when I tell you guys, these are not my pets. These are co-workers. And they are co-workers who are happy to complain about me. They do not love me. Not one day have I ever walked in their enclosure, sitting there, and they're wagging their tail, wondering where I've been all day. I get no hockey hugs and kisses. It is always just giving the food and go away. But then also, when a bird of prey is a chick, they are full size by 30 days. They progress so insanely fast that in that one week time, the damage was done. And he learned very quickly that human beings can be a source of food. And like that, he was no longer able to go back out into nature anymore. There is nothing wrong with this bird. He is perfectly visioned. He has perfect flight. He just doesn't know the right laws of nature. He's 17 years old. So if you ever, 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 ever find an animal who you think might be in some kind of need of assistance, it is so critically important that you call a wildlife rehabilitator as fast as possible because that will always be that, that animal's opportunity at staying in nature where they belong. Had he gotten to a rehabber right away, they could have put him with a surrogate. They might have actually been able to replace him up in the nest as well. So do not believe social media. It is so important to get these things back into the hands of the individuals who are actually licensed and trained to take care of them in the best possible way. All right, guys, well, that is all the time and all the fun little birds I have for you. So if you have any last additional questions, certainly feel free to come up and ask. Also, if you have an organization who you feel a presentation like this would be a very, very fun thing for, certainly come on up. I have plenty of cards. I would be more than happy to work with you. But other than that, have a wonderful rest of the day. Have a great rest of the weekend, and hopefully I'll see you all again next year. Thank you so much.